How important is it that leaders of our two institutions, soon to be one institution, are standing here tonight talking about global health? How significant that one of the integrated Rutgers UMDNJ's first public collaborations for students is a global health fair. It's going to be an exciting time to be a student here when a world-class university combines with a first-rate academic medical center to work together on global health. It's a lot of firepower, and all of us interested in global health should encourage it and take the fullest advantage of it. I was invited here tonight aha, to talk to students, and despite the presence of so many others in the audience this evening, my remarks remain directed to them particularly. Global health is a big topic, certainly more than any speaker can do justice to in 40 minutes, though maybe two and a half minutes has the uh, prize. Global health um, requires a lot of time, a lot of thought, and a lot of input from a lot of people. I've organized my comments around just a few key points, any one of which could be a full talk. So tonight, I'm going to look at just a couple of topics at random. The globalization of health, what that means, and how it alters how we think about a definition of global health. Some 21st century phenomenon that have and will continue to have major impacts on the health of the world. I want to talk briefly about the role of medicine in the context of two global health concerns, non-communicable diseases and HIV AIDS. And lastly, some thoughts on careers in global health. Almost everything in our lives today is touched by global forces. Health is no exception. Take, for example, transportation. In 1907, the International Office of Public Hygiene was established to coordinate international guidelines relating to the quarantining of ships in European harbors in an effort to limit the spread of cholera. Today, infectious diseases can spread far more rapidly and far more broadly, as we saw in 2003 when SARS spread within weeks from an outbreak in Hong Kong to near epidemic proportions, with more than 8,000 reported cases in 37 countries. People are more mobile today. Teams of relief workers can get to scenes of humanitarian disasters, often in a matter of hours. Health professionals move with relative ease between countries in pursuit of higher paying jobs in the developing world, often dramatically reducing the number of available health workers in developing world countries. Global communications brings us information about the health of people in other parts of the world at a faster pace than ever before. We can be warned in advance of impending natural disasters and emergency measures put in place to reduce negative health effects. Heightened public awareness of global inequities can fuel social political activism around health as a human right. But global communication has another side. In both electronic and print media throughout the world, images of peace and plenty appear in stark contrast to those of conflict and scarcity. Stories of the haves and the have-nots cross national boundaries with lightning speed by cell phones and internet. We hear and see the voices of the privileged and the besieged, the healthy and the sick, the well-fed and the starving through ever-changing forms of social media. Conflict is everywhere, killing many and devastating the lives of many more. In 2009, the UN Refugee Agency reported that the total number of people forcibly uprooted by conflict and persecution around the world stood at 42 million, including 16 million refugees and asylum seekers and 26 million people uprooted within their own countries. Political battles over resources hold the development and distribution of health resources hostage, and endless struggles over land, power, and natural resources create poor health environments and limit the availability of health resources for current and future generations. International trade has made our borders porous. Countries can deliver or receive life-saving food and medicine rapidly. They can export and import poor diets, poor habits, 
drugs, and weapons. When markets shrink in one part of the world for commodities, such as cigarettes, bigger markets emerge in another. First world diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer are now major concerns in the third world. And infectious diseases, once thought controlled in the industrialized world, pose new global threats as human, insect, and animal vectors move rapidly around the world via air, land, and sea. It is in the context of a globalized environment that we must think about the meaning of global health. How might we characterize it? How do we define it? First, global health focuses on issues that directly or indirectly impact health of people and that can transcend national borders. Global health tends to concentrate on poor, more vulnerable, and underserved populations around the world. It promotes equity in access to health care and health resources. It embraces both prevention at a population level and clinical care at an individual one. Good ideas to address health challenges don't always move from the first world to the third world. Solutions rely on the resources, knowledge, and talents of many societies to address health challenges. Many interventions and health promotion strategies require global cooperation to develop and implement them. Perhaps most importantly, the tools we need to achieve major gains in human well-being, as framed, for example, in the Millennium Development Goals, extend beyond the skill sets of those in medicine and the health sciences. Let's look at three defining features of the 21st century world that are going to have profound implications for health, urbanization, climate change, and inequality. The first global trend I'd like to talk to you about is urbanization. In the next decade, most urban growth will occur in less developed countries. By 2020, there is forecast to be 22 cities with populations in excess of 10 million people. 16 of these cities will be in developing world countries. By 2020, there is forecast to be 400 cities with populations in excess of 1 million people each. 70% of these cities will also be in the developing world. By 2030, the UN Population Fund estimates that 60% of all urban dwellers will be younger than 18 years. With the growth of cities comes the growth of slums. The number of people in the world living in slum households is therefore also on the rise. The United Nations defines a slum household as a group of individuals living under the same roof in an urban area who lack one or more of the following. Durable housing, sufficient living area, access to improved water, access to sanitation, and secure tenure. This could sound to some of you like a description of living conditions in recent weeks in New Jersey. The difference here, however, is that many of New Jersey's residents will eventually rebuild for themselves and their families, many with the help of insurance claims, federal dollars, and social service agencies. Sadly, of course, some will not. But globally, for millions of slum dwellers, these conditions are permanent. There are few, if any, safety nets. More than 90% of slum dwellers today live in developing world countries. China and India alone account for more than one-third of the world's slums. 72% of the urban population in sub-Saharan Africa live in slum conditions, 56% in South Asia. From a health perspective, a positive case might, and I emphasize might, be made for urbanization. When people concentrate in urban areas, they are often closer to health services and facilities. Governments can maximize the reach of limited health resources to the maximum number of citizens by concentrating health systems in densely populated areas. 
The same can be said of government-supported clean water and sanitation systems. Cities can offer employment opportunities beyond agricultural and the prospect of increased household earnings through wages. The health negatives attending urbanization are much more obvious and frankly far more likely. Rapid and unplanned growth is often associated with poverty, environmental degradation, and population demands that outstrip service capacity. Data indicate a range of urban health hazards and associated health risks, including substandard housing, overcrowding, insufficient and contaminated drinking water, inadequate sanitation and solid waste disposal services, all of which can help spread vector-borne diseases, air pollution, industrial waste, and increased motor vehicle traffic, and the stress associated with poverty and unemployment. Subsistence farmers drawn to urban areas by prospects of employment often find themselves without the skills to access other forms of wage-earning labor. Family members, each of whom often were involved at some level in household food production at home, may no longer have a role. Power imbalances arising when one member of the family controls earnings can lead to the further marginalization of women, inequitable distribution of household resources among family members, and family violence. Climate change. According to the World Health Organization's 2010 fact sheet on health and the environment, 13 million deaths could be prevented every year by making our environments better. The agency estimates that one quarter of the global burden of disease, including over one third of the childhood burden, is due to modifiable factors in air, water, soil, and food. Global warming will affect the basic requirements for maintaining health, clean air and water, sufficient food, and adequate shelter. Currently, about 1.2 million people die each year from causes attributable to urban air pollution. 2.2 million people die from diarrheal diseases largely resulting from lack of access to clean water and sanitation and from poor hygiene. 3.5 million die from malnutrition, and approximately another 60,000 die each year in natural disasters. Gradual stresses on the natural, economic, and social systems that support health may be the greatest threats, resulting in reductions and seasonal changes in the availability of fresh water, regional drops in food production, and rising sea levels. By 2025, it is estimated that 3 billion people in over 48 countries will be facing shortages in fresh water. By 2020, the world will be experiencing global shortages in three of the four major grains. There is the real risk of deforestation and soil deterioration, natural and human-made environmental disasters. And what are the health risks associated with that climate change? Extreme air temperatures and air pollution directly contribute to a number of diseases, including cardiovascular and respiratory disease and asthma. Lack of fresh water resulting from floods, droughts, and contaminated water will compromise hygiene, limit the availability of safe drinking water, and create fertile breeding grounds for disease. Climate effects, climate effects on agriculture are likely to increase malnutrition, which in turn will increase the severity of many infectious diseases, particularly among young children. And who will be the most vulnerable to these health risks? Inhabitants of small islands, coastal villages, mega cities, and mountainous and polar regions. The elderly, people with infirmities and pre-existing medical conditions, children, the poor, especially poor women. Researchers estimate that the loss of healthy life years in low-income countries as a result of the health effects of global environment change are predicted to be 500 times the predicted loss in Europe. Inequality. 
Inequality is likely to remain a defining feature of the 21st century, as are the resulting health inequities in resources and burdens of disease. Take Africa, for example. According to recent figures from UNICEF, Africa has 12% of the world's population, 25% of the global disease burden, 3% of the world's health workers, and 1% of the economic resources. Globally, the poorest 40% of the world's population accounts for 5% of the global income. The richest 10% account for 54% of the global income. 20% of the population in the developed world were reported to consume 86% of the world's goods. And the three richest people in the world control more wealth than all 600 million people living in the world's poorest countries. Inequality is actually a value-neutral term. Whether or not it is morally acceptable depends on whether or not we feel that the inequality between two people, between two groups, or between two countries is just. In other words, do we think it's fair? When health risks and benefits are not fairly distributed, we refer to them as health inequities. Health inequities are avoidable inequalities in health between groups of people within countries and between countries. Avoidable inequalities. These inequities arise from inequalities within and between societies, social and economic conditions and their effects on people's lives have a great deal of influence on their risk of illness and the actions taken to prevent or treat illness when it occurs. The distribution among countries of the burdens of disease and the resources to prevent and respond to poor health outcomes continues to be one of the defining features of our day. Can we actually find it fair that the chances of an infant dying before its first birthday is two in a thousand if she's born in Iceland, but 120 in 1,000 if she's born in Mozambique? Do we consider it just that the lifetime risk of maternal death during or shortly after pregnancy is only one in 17,400 if you are a woman in Sweden, but one in eight if you are a woman in Afghanistan? Most health inequities are socially determined. We call these the social determinants of health. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These conditions clearly vary between countries. Less obvious is the extent to which they vary within countries. In Bolivia, babies born to women with no education have infant mortality greater than 100 per 1,000 live births while the infant mortality rate of babies born to mothers in Bolivia with at least secondary education is under 40 per thousand. Globally, maternal mortality is higher in women living in rural areas and among poorer communities. Intra-country health inequalities are partly shaped by inequities in the distribution of health care resources. It's best described by something called an inverse care law, which suggests that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. In other words, a disproportionate share of health care services is used disproportionately by those with high incomes, while the poor have greater need and much less access. Put simply, the poorest of the poor anywhere in the world have the worst health. So what about the role of medicine? Medicine, nursing, and other healthcare professions have essential roles to play in achieving gains in global health. They are necessary features of strategies to improve health outcomes in populations around the world. They are not sufficient. They are only part of the skill set that is required. Consider briefly two major global health challenges, noncommunicable diseases 
and HIV AIDS. Non-communicable diseases account for 63% of, of all deaths worldwide. More than 25% of deaths attributed to NCDs occur in people younger than 60 years. 80% of these under 60 deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, and diabetes are the leading causes worldwide of preventable morbidity and related disability. Non-communicable diseases are largely preventable. The major NCDs are linked to a common set of risk factors, tobacco use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, harmful use of alcohol. According to the drafters of the 2011 UN Declaration on Chronic Diseases, 10% of what determines an individual's likelihood of mortality from an NCD can be attributed to the quality of medical care. By contrast, 50% of the determinants for chronic disease mortality are health behaviors. These are modifiable and preventable, but rely on strategies outside the traditional medical realm. Other risk factors for NCDs are more intractable. They are social determinants and include poverty, uneven distribution of wealth, lack of education, rapid urbanization, population aging, economic, social, gender, political, behavioral, and environmental determinants of health. According to the 2012 UN AIDS report of the global AIDS epidemic, 34 million people are living with AIDS at, with HIV at the end of 2011. Sub-Saharan Africa remains most severely affected with nearly one in every 20 adults, about 4.9% living with HIV and accounting for 69% of the people living with HIV in the world. Almost 5 million people are living with HIV in South Southeast and East Asia combined. After Sub-Saharan Africa, the regions most heavily affected are the Caribbean and Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where 1% of adults are living with HIV as of 2011. Worldwide, women constitute more than half of all people living with HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS is the leading cause of death globally for women in their reproductive years. I just need to read that again. HIV AIDS is the leading cause of death globally for women in their reproductive years. In Sub-Saharan Africa, women constitute 59% of all people living with HIV AIDS. Among young people aged 15 to 24, the HIV prevalence rate for young women is twice that of young men. As treatments for persons with HIV become more effective, and are available more widely, though by no means universally. The global focus on the war on HIV AIDS has shifted to prevention. Prevention strategies fall into two categories. The first, to reduce transmission of HIV through interventions targeting persons who are already infected with the virus. In other words, interventions which are administered to someone else in order to reduce the likelihood that they will affect another. These include prevention of mother-to-child transmission programs, which involve the administration of antiretrovirals to HIV-positive expectant mothers to reduce the likelihood that the disease will be passed on to their newborns. ARV treatment of positive partners in discordant couples to avoid the infected person passing the disease onto his or her uninfected partner. And the strategy gaining traction among the HIV research community, ARV treatment as prevention on a population level, i.e., treating those at highest risk of transmitting the disease to others, such as sex workers, men who have sex with men, intravenous drug users, and, as is currently the subject of major clinical trials in Africa, those HIV-infected individuals with high viral loads. 
We might ask why the increasing emphasis on using antiretroviral treatments as prevention strategies, particularly at a time when it is not yet universally accessible to those who need it. Consider the other category of preventive strategies and what it involves. The second line of defense against HIV transmission is strategies that rely on uninfected individuals taking steps to protect themselves from becoming infected by others. In other words, a precaution you take yourself. Look at what these include. Avoidance of high-risk behaviors. Finding out what behaviors increase your risk and avoiding them. Multiple concurrent sexual partners. Needle sharing. Unprotected sex and early sexual debut. Adherence to safe behaviors, abstinence, being faithful, condom use, remember that? Uh, clean needles, male circumcision, microbicides, if it turns out they work, and if women are in a position to use them. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, and vaccines, although a viable candidate for vaccines will probably not be available for at least another decade. The themes espoused at this year's World AIDS Conference is Know Your Epidemic, Know Your Response. It reflects a new commitment to tailor prevention strategies to the epidemiological contours of particular countries and particular communities. But what works in one community may not work in another, even within the same age and gender cohort. Why? Social, economic, and political environments in which an individual lives impacts their ability to exercise these preventive steps, even when they know they will work. Let me give you some quick examples just based on my own experiences in Southern Africa. Recommending condom use to a woman who goes home to a sexually abusive partner isn't going to work. Women and girls living in highly gendered environments in which they have little capacity to exercise choice may find it impossible to negotiate safe sex, delay sexual debut, or promote fidelity on the part of their male partners. And women and girls who lack basic necessities of life are less likely to make safe choices about sex if high-risk sexual behaviors may be avenues for food, clothing, and shelter. If these strategies are to work, as we know they do in controlled environments with high adherence, we need more than medicine. We need the ability to transform cultural and social norms, to empower women, to provide widespread education, to reduce want, and to encourage safe choices. This is a huge task. To achieve gains in global health, we need more than medicine, more than just people who choose careers in medicine and the health professions. Global health problems and the key to their solutions are multidimensional. To succeed, preventive strategies often require social, economic, and behavioral change. Social and political circumstances affect all aspects of life and well-being, and therefore health. We will need sociologists, social workers, engineers, business executives, agricultural specialists, anthropologists, and teachers. Many of the major health problems in the world exist because of inequities between and within countries of how resources are distributed. And significant gains in global health will ultimately depend on the redistribution of resources in a more equ equitable way. I'd like to direct the last few minutes of these remarks to students who want to pursue careers in global health. What are the implications of the fact that global health solutions require multidisciplinary approaches? A few suggestions for those of you who are medical students. Engage early and often in your medical studies with others 
both in medicine and outside medicine, with common interests in global health. Join or start journal clubs. Identify faculty here and across the Rutgers campus that are knowledgeable in parts of the world or in global problems that interest you. Find out more. Look for clubs and on-campus groups outside of the health sphere that worry about global issues. Engineers Without Borders, social justice groups, and some of the live and learn communities on the Rutgers campuses. Consider a global health experience while you are in medical school, particularly if you can between your first and second year, or at least at the end of your studies. But think carefully, research the countries, and the problems before you decide on an experience. Do some homework. Medical tourism is not what developing countries need. If you are not a medical student or pursuing a career in the health professions, but you're interested in global health, recognize that there are important contributions to be made in your chosen field. And lastly, understand that you don't need to leave home to be involved in global health. Global health is here, all around us. Look at the faces. Look at the communities right here in New Brunswick or in your hometown. Poverty, inequality, hunger. These are not only the problems of elsewhere. Global health is here and needing your attention. Thank you.